Alright, welcome back. Uh, now, we are continuing on with this concept of information processing. We're going to move on from attention in this second section to the process of memory. And just like with attention, as we look at development, we see that our memory skills improve as we age. And there's multiple aspects to memory, once again, that typically grow. The first aspect of our memory that grows is our capacity, the amount of information that we can store and the amount of information that we can actually attend to. And when we think about basic processing of a child, usually they can only really process around two or three things, and we'll actually look at those things as we kind of cover the process of development. But uh, you know, children at a very young age don't have the ability to store that much information, and they certainly can't fiddle with multiple things within their head. As we grow, as we age, we get much better at that capacity. So we have more that we can remember, we have more that we can deal with and handle, and all of those things are kind of a product of growth in our nervous system and our area that's associated with memory. The other thing that's really good for us as we age, uh, and really recognizable when we look at differences between individuals, is that our span of memory increases. So if I tell you something right now, or maybe I guess if we talked about something in the 20, 30 minutes ago, you should be able to remember it even 10, 15, 20 minutes from now. If a child is doing this, you know, if a child is listening to this exercise, uh, their ability to remember what we covered five minutes ago is very weak. And that's because their memory span is very limited at a young age. The other thing that's really big with our memory skills is the fact that we can uh, organize information much better when we're older. So we can make connections between things. We can kind of categorize new information in very effective ways so we can access that information better when we're asked to recall it. And this relates to a concept of something that we've already talked about earlier with Piaget, uh, but it's kind of a new definition of it when we look at uh, more scientific cognitive processing approaches, and this is this concept of something called schemas. So it's the way we can organize or make sense of specific pieces of information. So with Piaget, his definition of schemas was based on this idea of uh, us kind of trying to understand how the world works. Well, that's sort of one aspect of schemas, but when we talk about it from a cognitive uh, research-based perspective, we're talking about schemas as kind of categorization methods. So, you know, I have a schema of, you know, how this class is going to go. So I get the slides in, I get your write-ups, I grade them, I enter them in. You might have a schema about how that goes, and all this is a process that's going on. We might also have schemas of, you know, what a fish is. So it's got fins, it's got eyes, it's got a tail, it's got all these different aspects, it lives underwater. All of these things kind of fit under the umbrellas of schemas. Right? And that idea of schemas is something that we see that grows as we age into adulthood as well. The last thing that also grows in our ability to process things, or in our memory aspect of processing, is the ability for us to actually retrieve information. So if I ask you about your first grade teacher, you probably should be able to come up with it if you think hard enough. Maybe not. Uh, I guess maybe if I asked you about, you know, your, what was it, your senior, your best friend in the sixth grade, we'll say that. You probably should be able to come up with that name fairly quickly, like we did in that earlier exercise, where I think I asked you to come up with your best friend in the eighth grade. Well, that task not only is something that you can do, but you should be able to do it much, much faster as you age, as you progress. And your memory becomes a little bit more fluid, so you have the ability to kind of access memory without having to go through a bunch of processes and trying to think about things uh, in a much deeper way than you're physically capable of doing. So when we look at memory skills, even though most of us think that our memory is relatively set and we're not really changing much except for the type of information that we're remembering, we actually do see in developmental studies growth in memory skills in a number of different ways. Another thing that we see with memory is not only do specific kind of overarching ideas of memory skills grow with age, but specific types 
of memory also grow with age. In particular, when we look at memory and the different temporal levels, so when something is processed and how we're dealing with it, uh, we see that there's actually growth in uh, specific types of temporal memory. Uh, and when we talk about temporal memory, just for a review, for those of you who've never had an intro to psych class, we actually have three types of temporal memory that we actually focus on. The first type is something called sensory memory, and this is information uh, that's just presented to us in our immediate environment. So we have, in theory, what a lot of researchers believe, uh, a fraction of a second within our head to be able to attend to every single thing that's important that's actually being presented to us in our environment so if you're sitting right now on your couch or somewhere else and you're processing what's going on you might have you know a fish tank in the background you might have a dog on the couch you might have a TV on in the background you might have somebody else trying to talk to you and what we believe is going on in cognitive psychology especially when you're an adult is that your brain is actually processing all of that information for a very brief period of time but if you don't decide to pay attention to it all of that information just immediately disappears you can't even recognize that you were even paying attention to that information uh, to begin with and there's been a number of studies to show that this sensory memory does probably exist but it doesn't hold that much importance because you know we only pay attention to a small amount of stuff and that stuff that we do pay attention to actually moves to the next stage of memory that we call short-term memory or working memory the the area of memory where we're actually focusing in on something that's in our immediate environment and this can involve information from the past so if we're thinking about that past experience that really interacts with what we're going through right now and we're thinking about you know who we're interacting with or what we're dealing with that with all of that involves working memory this kind of interaction of the immediate and the past in order to really effectively maneuver in the environment that we're actually in and short-term memory as we're gonna see in a little while skills in particular short-term memory skills of bringing in the past and interacting with the present grow with age the other part of memory, the last part of memory that we have is something called long-term memory. This is information that's stored in our head and it can be recalled later on if there's kind of the right situation and we need to bring it into our short-term memory or our working memory. But a lot of times this long-term memory, this information that we have, just sits there. It just kind of processes and our mind kind of keeps it. Sometimes it's changing due to new experiences. So if you think about maybe that friend that you had in your freshman year, junior year of college, uh, freshman year of high school, we'll say, since some of you might not have gotten to your junior year of college, uh, your freshman year of high school, uh, you know, you might have had some specific experiences with him that you had. But if you find out, in a, you know, a week from now, that something else happened to them, that there was something else that was going on while you were interacting with them at some point in time, your perspective of them might change, and your memories of those events that you had with them during those freshman year might be altered. And this is kind of one of the critical aspects of our long-term memories. Not only do we store that past information, but we can alter it. We can manipulate it based on current experiences. So the next time we recall that information, the next time it gets processed in our working memory, we'll have the rewritten version of that past. And uh, there's a belief that this ability to kind of manipulate our long-term memory and recall and store information within our long-term memory is also something that grows with age. Another way that we can classify memory is the type of memories that we actually have. So we've got the temporal stages of memory, but we've also got different forms of memory that we can actually display. In particular, we have two major categories of memory called implicit memory and explicit memory. Implicit memory is that information where we don't really recognize that we know it, we just know it. So, you know, your feelings about uh, your parents or the ability to actually ride a bike or, you know, the connection that you have with the television and how to watch it. All of those behaviors are not something you typically articulate, and very often you can't 
really articulate how to do these things or how these things are associated very easily. But they're still a part of your memory. The other part of memory that we have, though, is one that you can articulate, that you're consciously aware of, and that's called explicit memory. Now, some of this explicit memory can be completely false. Right? You can remember an event in a way that never happened, or you could imagine something that never happened. But either way, these are types of uh, explicit memories. And sometimes we have semantic memories, so memories of an actual idea. So the first president of the United States would be a great example of a semantic memory. You probably never met him. You probably don't remember the first day that you learned that he was the first president of the United States. But you still have that memory in your head. And that's one type of an explicit memory called a semantic memory. The other type that we have is called an episodic memory. So, uh, memory of a specific instance of a specific event. So, that first memory that you ever have of doing something or going somewhere would be uh, an example of an ex episodic memory. Uh, maybe that first kiss that you ever had or the first fight that you ever had with somebody you know. All of those things are examples of episodic memories, and we have a number of those in our life as well. And when we look at these classifications of memory, and we're going to talk about this in a few seconds, we're going to see growth in this as well when we age from infancy to adulthood. If we focus in on infants and look at their growth, what we often see is that starting off, just like in thinking skills and attention skills, Infants really don't have much memory at all. In fact, uh, what we see after kind of assuming they had zero memory is uh, that their memory is almost entirely what we call implicit based. So just kind of basic reactions to stimuli. And one classic study sh that showed that children's actually children actually did have implicit memory was one that was done in kind of an ingenious fashion where. Uh, researchers took young infants, placed them in a crib, and actually had a mobile placed above them in this crib. And it was just in range for a child to kind of put its foot up, kick it, and cause that mobile to move and change and present stimuli that was uh, enjoyable to the infant. Well, after kind of being exposed to that a number of times, the researchers brought the child in, placed them on the bed, and remove the mobile from the room. But what they saw, which was really interesting, was these children, even though there was no mobile there, proceeded to kick. And that kicking pattern wasn't believed to be kind of a reaction of frustration or of anger, but what they believed was an implicit reaction to that mobile that was originally there. They were displaying a memory of that crib and the recognition that if they kicked, usually good things happened. Well, uh, you know, there's some question as to whether or not uh, this uh, really is clear-cut evidence that the implicit memory is there, or whether or not there's other types of memory that were involved in that pattern, but it does seem to show that children have some basic type of memory in infancy, even though it's extremely limited. But they also see that uh, when we talk about memory span, so how long we can remember something in our long-term memory or process something, uh, it's very, very short. So at about six months of age, you know, just halfway through, well, a quarter of the way through infancy, I guess, kids can only remember things for about a day. If anything happens for more than a day, in particular explicit things happen for more than a day, a child's not going to remember it. They're not going to be able to process that. Now, that might not be the case for traumatic experiences, or at least traumatic experiences might change the overall demeanor and behavior of a child. But the ability to explicitly remember anything seems limited, uh, at least we've found this in a number of studies, it seems limited to about 24 hours. At the time we reach near the end of infancy, so we get to about 20 months, that ability to remember has grown to about a year. So if there's something traumatic with a specific person or a specific event, a child can display behaviors that indicate memory uh, for over a year. So if they maybe had a doctor's visit that they didn't like, or a person that they met once that they didn't like, or maybe even somebody that they met that they did like, usually they can show memory, even brief chases of memory, 
uh, of that event for up to a year. And that's a huge shift in memory capabilities from just a y six months to two years. And we see that kind of growth in memory as we continue on into childhood. But that growth in memory is fairly limited. Uh, and in particular, what we see is up to about the age of three, everything that we've experienced, every memory skill that we have, all but disappears. In fact, we call this uh, lack of memory, or this huge lapse in memory that skills that we have at this age, we call it infantile amnesia, the inability for adults to remember anything from their infancy, so years, actually up to three years of age uh, or uh, below. Now, we're not sure why infantile amnesia happens, and we think maybe part of it's a lack of brain development within the hippocampus and other regions associated with memory. But we also think that uh, one of the other big causes with this lack of memory is that we don't have any verbal skills to actually remember these events. Now, some people are very skeptical of this. In fact, some people insist that they can remember their birth and all of this. But when we actually ask for specific details, a lot of times what we recognize is that people remember what they were told about these events. So if a child says, you know, I remember this particular experience, I remember doing this, usually they're remembering what their parents told them, or remembering what whoever they were with told them actually happened. And uh, we don't, at least uh, through scientific research, have any conclusive evidence to show that anybody is really able to remember anything before the age of three. And that's because our, what we believe is because our language skills and our memory skills are still very, very limited at this stage. When we get into childhood, though, we start to really increase our memory skills. In particular, those long-term memory skills that we talked about, the stuff that we're able to take into our working memory, and the stuff that we're able to store for a long period of time, gets much, much greater. We remember more things, and we remember them in a much more effective manner, so they don't get all jumbled and kind of random when we're asked to recall them later. We also uh, typically grow in our ability to access that long-term memory. So not only are we restoring more, not only are we storing more things better, but we can get at it and it doesn't get completely confounded when we're trying to remember that. Our short-term memory skills also increase dramatically. And you can see this in the chart above. At about the age of two, when a child has read a list of numbers, they can only remember about two to three numbers uh, if they read a list of ten numbers. But as we progress, four, six, eight, to ten years of age in childhood, what we see is that ability to remember gets dramatically better. So we get to almost six numbers within eight years. And that might not seem like a huge step, but uh, the required connections, the required ability that allows us to make that jump is actually very amazing. It's a, it's a very dramatic increase in memory skills that are associated with short-term memory. And it not only allows us to remember more, but we remember multiple types of things, or we can attend to multiple types of things because our short-term memory skills have increased. That doesn't mean, though, that memories entirely perfect, though, at this particular stage in comparison to adolescents and adults. In fact, when we look at a number of memory studies on both long-term memory and short-term memory in children, we see that there's a lot of fallibility in these memory skills. Uh, one classic study that was done uh, to show how fallible children's memory skills have been done uh, by researchers that uh, have essentially given children hypothetical situations, told them stories about what happened yesterday. And when these kids are asked whether or not that event happened, they really have no ability to discern between whether or not the, the event that they were told and what they actually remembered happening were different from each other. So you can tell a child, you know, that we went to the park yesterday, we went to Disneyland yesterday, and if you were convincing enough, they'd actually believe that they did go to the park, or they did go to Disneyland when in actuality they hadn't. And that's because their memory, even though it's getting better, is still very susceptible 
the influence of others. Another thing that we see is that uh, their memory is entirely random. So we kind of talked about this with attention. Not only do kids pay attention to random things when they ask them about their day, but they remember those random things. You know, they're not only focusing in on random stuff, but they're recalling all these silly kind of mundane details. And we're not sure if this is just because their attention spans aren't great or they just don't know how to tell a story. But we, we do believe that a big part of this is also memory. That they, they just can't pick up on what to actually remember. So their long-term memory might have more capacity, but it's still kind of filled with random stuff at this point in time. After childhood, after we get into uh, adulthood, we start to kind of increase our memory all the way up to about the age of, well, it's around 55 to 60. Uh, after the time we get about 55 to 60, we see uh, a real decline in memory skills. In fact, uh, a number of studies have shown that actually at about age 45, there starts to be a slow, slow decline in working memory skills and capacity skills. So we remember less items and we can tend to less things after about the age of 45. But it's not like it's a huge, dramatic job drop in memory skills like we see in drops in physical skills. And in fact, up to about the age of 70, uh, the drop is completely unrecognizable. You can't see any ability for people to, I guess, lose their episodic memory skills or their short-term memory skills uh, that, uh, that we would typically see in other individuals. So their performance is almost the same as they were when they are younger. Uh, there's some variations to that. If you have some physical trauma or you really don't use your memory at all. But for most people, you know, there's a small decline in memory skills starting about the age of 45, but it's uh, fairly maintained uh, throughout our life, fairly well maintained throughout our lives. As we age, though, what we see is that there's also a shift in uh, our specific types of memory that we can remember. So. Uh, when we look at semantic information, you know, those basic pieces of information, how to interact with things, our memory is fairly well maintained throughout our life. In fact, even when we reach about the age of 90, there's very little difference in our semantic skills. So if we knew how to use a bus, we still know how to use a bus. If we know how to tie our shoes, we'll still know how to tie our shoes at the age of 90. Now. Uh, the semantic skills might not improve in the sense that we might not be able to learn that many new things and process that much new stuff when we're older, but what we've known, we get to maintain pretty much throughout our entire lives. The one memory thing, thing the memory aspect that does drop, though, is our episodic memory. So we forget more events. Uh, and what also seems interesting is that we seem to really not remember much about our lives after about the age of 35 or 40. In fact, there's this huge gap a lot of times that we see in studies between about the age of 40 and, say, 60 to 70 that seems to contain almost no information. And we can remember big events, big things that happened in that stage, but it's like the brain has all but turned off its long-term memory skills to be able to retain information that we experience at this age. Now, some people have proposed that that lack of episodic memory skills and that lack of, uh, lack of ability to really focus on things is physical, uh, so there's a cause to it with either some kind of decrease in the, the memory skills of the brain, uh, but other researchers have also proposed that this is entirely socially caused, or it's derived through social factors. In essence, there's just not that much to remember. And they propose that if a person has some interesting experiences at that age, that their memory skills should be equal to those that uh, are younger, so people in their 20s and 30s. That might be the case. Uh, in fact, uh, there's some research to show that the, that very well could indeed be the case. But uh, you know, there's still what we see in studies when we look at large aggregates of individuals. Some dramatic differences between the memory capacity and the amount of events remembered uh, when people get past about the age of 40. When we look specifically at episodic memory. 
Another thing that we see when we get into older age with memory is, uh, is that other problems start to emerge. So not only can we not remember quite as much, but uh, we seem to struggle with a lot of memory skills. So the speed of accessing information, that, that processing of working memory that we talked about earlier, uh, becomes very, very limited. So if we ask somebody to talk about something, and you might have seen this with elderly people when you talk to them, uh, a lot of times it just takes them longer to remember the events. It takes them more time to be able to categorize things and talk about something. And that usually indicates kind of a lack of communication skills when you're talking to them. But in actuality, when we look at it from a developmental perspective, what we usually assume this is is just a kind of a slowing down of memory skills, a slowing down of our long-term memory processing. Another problem that starts to emerge when we get into our much later years is the fact that we start to lose something called source memory, where, or uh, I guess uh, the information of where something was actually learned. So if we went to a speech, we might kind of get things muddled as to who was speaking or where that speech was or who we liked or what was going on. And that's uh, kind of the basic background of the information. So we'll remember details of something. We might even remember details of something very well. But all the periphery stuff, where things are coming from, where we learned it, start to decay and they start to decline as we get into our later years. And then we also, one of the big problems that we see with memory in particular in health related memory is that people also tend to lose something called their perspective memory, their ability to remember to do something in the future. So if you think about the need to take pills, the need to go see a doctor, all of these things actually require perspective memory kind of remembering your routine, remembering what you have to do. And, uh, you know, this is unfortunate because this is the exact part in or the exact time in people's lives where perspective memory is extremely important. And because of that, a number of studies and projects have been developed to try to help the elderly work on their perspective memory skills or at least adapt to these lacking perspective memory skills that they have as they age. <laughs> All right, now in addition to the ability to pay attention to things or the growth and the ability to pay attention to things and the ability to remember things, or at least uh, remember things in a number of different ways, uh, there's one other aspect to information processing that grows as we age. And that last aspect of information processing that we're going to address here in this last section of the class is thinking skills. And when we look at thinking skills, just like with memory and just like with attention, we can actually break down thinking skills into subcategories. And the first subcategory of thinking skills that we see growth in is in the ability to do something called critical thinking, the ability to really master the meaning of things. And when we look at young infants, what we see oftentimes is that most kids really lack critical thinking skills at birth and lack critical thinking skills for a long period of time. And this is partially dictated by kind of our limited memory skills and our limited attention skills. But what we also see with critical thinking skills is when we're looking for kind of growth in uh, the ability to understand things, the growth and the ability to really get what we should get out of something, a lot of that growth is more learned than anything. Uh, so not only do people have to kind of make connections after experiencing those things a lot, but they also have to learn how to make those connections. And these critical thinking skills, unlike memory skills and unlike attention skills, don't usually just come up naturally. In fact, a number of studies have shown that one of the best ways to improve critical thinking skills is to actually teach these skills to children and teach these skids, uh, skills even to teens and adults. In fact, uh, even college classes nowadays have been designed to help kids improve their critical thinking skills because what we see numerous times is that even though our critical thinking skills do on average improve with time when we've got large aggregates of people, the only way that these improvements typically happen is through experience. So when you're pushed to actually come up with the meaning of things or process how things are connected, 
uh, until that happens, uh, your critical thinking skills will be fairly limited throughout your life. But fortunately for us, uh, most of us are going to encounter critical thinking challenges at numerous points in time, and that allows us to kind of grow in these particular skills so we can use them in future encounters. Another type of thinking skill that also changes with age, but not quite as much as critical thinking skills, is the ability to do something called categorization. Uh, and that involves classifying stimuli and different concepts into specific groups. Now these groups are kind of random sometimes, uh, but uh, the ability to classify things, no matter how you're classifying them, involves this process of categorization. And when we do studies on categorization skills, what we see, which is kind of surprising, is that even young children and infants possess the ability to categorize very, very early in life. But what they don't possess is very good, I guess, mindsets or connections that we use in our categorization. So when we ask a child to sort toys or objects into specific categories, they know what they need to do. But their categorization is kind of random, and it's not always consistent. As we age, we get more and more consistent with our ability to categorize, and we can get better at our categorizing, uh, I guess, uh, justification for what we're actually seeing. So if we look at this picture on the next slide, and I were to ask you to take these objects and separate them into four categories, uh, a child could probably do this, but the child's way of categorizing these things would be somewhat random. Now, your way of categorizing these things probably isn't going to be 100% set. These items are kind of random to begin with. But uh, there's going to be more, I guess, more thought behind the way you categorize things. So there's going to be better justification for the way that you're actually categorizing things, and you're going to be somewhat more consistent in your categorization. So if you want to, you can come up with four distinct categories where every object just can belong into one uh, of the categories. And most of the time we can do this uh, with fairly minimal ease take some effort, it might take some connections, and since this picture is not great, it might take some studying as to what these objects actually are, but this process of putting things into distinct groups is something that we see in studies, uh, that's something kids can do, but we get much better at it as we age through experience and just through growth in our understanding of how things might be linked. Another final way that we actually improve our thinking skills is through the process of problem solving. In essence, we're talking about finding ways to obtain a goal. With infants, most of their ways of obtaining goals uh, you know, are just reactionary. So they've got the reflexes, and there's not much thought beyond that until we get to things like our secondary reflexes and other kind of more basic ways of getting at what we're trying to gain. But as we age, uh, as we kind of move along, we start to get better and better at our problem solving skills. Children, when we test them on problems like the one you see on your right, typically don't have ideas as to how to approach these things, and they just use more of a trial and error process. And they'll throw things around, try to move things around in this matchstick problem, and eventually they might come to a right solution. As adults, what we see is a lot of our problem-solving skills start to revolve around previous strategies. And most of the time, those previous strategies help us solve problems. But sometimes, as we might see in this picture, it can actually limit us. So a lot of times when we see this matchstick problem, what we often find is that people that are capable of answering problem A and problem B, because they've answered problem A and problem B, are typically more limited in their ability to problem solve problem C because it's a slightly different type of problem. It requires a change or a tweak that we're not accustomed to and that involves uh, this kind of automatic tendency for us as adults to rely on some of those previous strategies and until we can abandon those previous strategies, which my telling you 
that we can use it to abandon strategies uh, it kind of does for you uh, is really what's necessary for us to solve some of the more complex problems that requires to go beyond the box but or to go outside the box uh, but most of the time, this kind of relying on previous strategies does help us interact with things much more efficiently and much more quickly uh, than we could if we were just using this testing strategy that children typically elicit when they're trying to solve problems. Unfortunately, though, when we look at problem solving and thinking skills, uh, aging, developing isn't always a benefit. In fact, uh, we, when we look at the process of thinking, we can revisit an old concept to see how thinking skills might actually cause more problems as we age. And this relates to this concept of automaticity that we talked about earlier, that ability to perform a cognitive process with little or no effort. Well, most of the time when we're doing basic things, like processing our memory, interacting with things, automaticity is great because we can interact with things more efficiently, we can do things much more quickly, and we can get on with life without having to think all the time about everything that's going on. And as we get older, all of these thinking skills that we just talked about, and all of the memory skills and attention skills that we talked about, become more and more automatic. And that's usually great for us, right? Because we don't have to worry about things, life is much easier, we can do all the things that we want to do. But with problem solving, automaticity sometimes is a problem. If we've come up with a solution to something that's just causing all of these headaches and issues, we get ourselves into a rut oftentimes when we become adults and we do stupid repetitive things that we're not able to overcome because our behaviors have become automatic. So, I'm sure some of you in this class might recognize the individuals up there, and they might be great examples, if you think about it, of people who have become automatic in their behaviors. They've found a way to do something, or they've found a repetitive way of getting what they want, and even if it's kind of silly or random, they go back to that well. They go back to those behaviors because that's what they've learned and it's very tough for us in problem solving and interacting with things in our world to abandon those behaviors as we become adults and uh, this not only hurts us with problem solving skills so when something's difficult we don't know exactly how to solve things but we also make some really stupid decisions some of the time based on that automatic reaction so we get a knee-jerk reaction we don't think about it we just do it and a lot of times that knee-jerk reaction it can sometimes lead us astray. It can lead us to problems. In particular, this is a big problem with teens as well, because not only do we become more automatic, we think left just because of our automaticity kicking in, but we've also got emotions, as we talked about earlier, really overriding a lot of our life. And that, that big emotional rush causes us to do those dangerous things, causes us to do those stupid things because they've almost become automatic. The, the need to challenge, that need to fight might cause us to do some kind of random things when we reach, in particular adolescence, but even adulthood for a lot of us because of this growth in, growth in automaticity. So even though automaticity is a good thing most of the time, I'm not saying you want to be less automatic in your life because it would be a lot more frustrating and challenging to think about every single thing of your life, uh, that automaticity does come sometimes at a cost. In particular, when we're trying to do new things that we don't want to rely on previous behaviors for, uh, it becomes much more challenging for us to abandon those behaviors. Now, unlike physical development, health benefit, developments, memory developments, and attention developments, thinking is one particular area that we see where as we age, we typically get better and better at that. Now, the reason for this is because unlike the previous ones, thinking is something that we seem to be naturally kind of inclined towards, and our growth is entirely experience-based. And as we age, no surprise, we get more experience. We encounter more things, we inspire more categories, we encounter more approaches to things, and that allows us 
to adapt better, to adjust better to our environment. And this deals with this topic of something called expertise. And in psychology, we define expertise as having some type of extensive knowledge, and organized knowledge, that allows us to interact within our particular domain. We might not be able to go outside of what we know, but with what we know, we're usually really, really good at understanding how to interact with it and how to manipulate it. We also tend to make better decisions because, uh, first of all, we know more options, and uh, we typically don't have to react on behaviors or we don't have to use behaviors that haven't worked well in the past, so our decision-making skills also get better. They just take a little bit longer for us to be able to actually elicit it. But what we see in a number of studies is that even though most of us overall get better, there's some really big, big difference in thinking skills across the elderly and across people as they age. And most of the things that affect this are education, health, and the work experience that somebody has. So if we're not very educated, if we have poor health, and we're stuck in a repetitive job, a lot of times thinking skills will stay almost at the level they were when this person was in their elementary years or even junior high and high school years. If somebody gets more education, if they're constantly challenged to think and learn things, their health is fairly good, and they find themselves in a job that constantly requires them to process things and interact with their world, we see a huge growth in thinking skills as we get older. If there's a variation of these things, thinking skills will kind of move with respect to the environment that somebody finds themselves in. So when we look at thinking, even though there might be a slow decline, a very small decline in the speed of thinking skills, the quality of thinking skills seems to improve with age for almost all individuals. It's just your environment shapes your ability to think. It shapes, I guess, your maximum potential of thinking skills that you can display. So when we look at today's class, just to kind of sum things up so you got a sense of what we were looking at, uh, in today's class we focused on cognitive development, uh, but we looked at specific aspects of cognitive development, so no overarching theories or ideas, but instead different cognitive processes that are involved in our ability to interact with our environment. And what we saw in almost every single aspect of cognitive development uh, is that we become much more quick and effective and diverse in our cognitive processing thing uh, skills until we reach adulthood. After adulthood, when we progress into late adulthood, a lot of those skills decline, but it's not nearly as dramatic as some of the skills that decline in our physical growth and our health growth. Uh, and we also saw one critical thing I want to stress is that our environment has a big, big impact on cognitive development. I can't stress enough how important it is if we want to improve our cognitive developments, if we want to continue to grow, to constantly challenge ourselves, to constantly think about things and keep our health uh, in top form in order for us to really maximize our cognitive skills in our environment. All right, folks, that marks the end of this class. Now, in our next class, things get a little interesting. We have exam one. Remember, it's 75 minutes to answer 60 questions, which means you have to be prepared for that exam. You're going to see all 75 questions pop up at once, which means you need to be ready to answer them. The moment you sit down, you need to have an Internet connection that's going to be ready to, to kind of work for the next hour and 15 minutes and you need to have an environment that doesn't cause any emergencies or issues come up that you have to leave the computer. So give yourself adequate time. You can take it whenever you want. It should be available to you within the next couple hours or days depending upon when you listen to this presentation. But when you're ready, when you get going, you know, give yourself every opportunity to do well. Remember you can use your book, you can use your notes because well, I can't control for that but We'll be checking that nobody's taking the exam together, so, so make sure that you're taking the exam alone. Good luck. Good luck in your studies. I know we've covered a lot, so make sure you give yourself a couple hours to review each section, and that should really help you. But if questions come up along the way, don't hesitate to ask. Take care, all.